this little thing on the upper left hand screen. And uh, I'm going to ask everybody to mute themselves. Um, or Roger, that's you. So, Mr. Mr. Castle, Mrs. Castle. So, whoever's making noise, uh, please mute yourself. And then we'll try to do that throughout the uh, throughout the meeting. We'll let, of course, the speaker uh, unmute himself. Um, as I said, my name is Larry Wade. I'm the uh, president of the Oregon Carvers Guild, but also the leader of the what's called a carving special interest group of the Guild of Oregon Woodworkers. So we have kind of a co-mingling of two different uh, organizations here. Um, the Carving Club has had a long history. Uh, at one point, it had 500 members uh, in the mid-70s and early 80s. And then everybody started dying. I don't, don't know where they went or why they started dying, but they started getting old. And things changed and it, uh, the carving membership dwindled. So we're, gonna, we're rebuilding the club. We think there's a lot of activity uh, that's going on that we don't even know about, let alone the stuff that we do. Um, there's a, always a question of how do you ask questions? So Marty is very open to answering questions. We just have to figure out how to feed them in. And what I would suggest, there's a couple ways to do it. If you'll use your chat and send a question into me, I will repost it or, or verbalize it. Or you can also just say, I have a question that I'd like to ask, and then I'll call on you. The third way is everybody shout at the same time and see what happens. And that's usually pretty chaotic. So we'll see how it goes. Um, well, uh, there's other ways to do it, but those are the ones that I can think of. This is normally a two hour program. We're gonna take a, try to take a few minute break uh, at about an hour. And we're gonna let Marty call when that should happen based on his own pacing. Uh, just to stand up, uh, I don't know what your experience is, but my back gets tired and different parts of my body and sometimes different parts need a break to stand up and move around. So we'll take a conscious break and we'll come back. Uh, Marty is uh, quite experienced. He's been teaching a long time. He is uh, nationally known, but he was unknown to me as of a couple, three or four months ago. So I was really delighted by accident uh, to see Mary May having him as one of his guests, her guest presenters. And so that was the, that was the connection. Uh, subsequently, I bought his book. Subsequently, I'm going to think about buying his knife, but I haven't done that. But I'm going to also invite Marty to tell about what he has. You know, he is here with the generous amount of time that he's given us, and I like to also use that as a an, an, an advertisement. So don't be, don't be bashful about saying what you have and what the resources are that would be available to everybody here. Um, I'm going to, as a host, I can spotlight him, and I'm going to do that. So I'm going to uh, make him fill up the screen, and everybody should be able to see him. And so, Marty, you should be, your, your screen should be filled up. So why don't you take it from here, and um, you paste it, and we'll help you. Sounds good, Larry. Uh, thank you for... Uh, inviting me for tonight. Glad to speak to you. I'm coming to you not from my usual location where I do webinars and my teaching, and that's because I'm away rebuilding a deck for some friends of ours up in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I'm about two hours north from where I'm normally located outside of Mankato, Minnesota, and I'm coming to you live from inside my RV. So um, that's one good thing about chip carving as well. It's easily portable. And uh, so I can bring my chip carving with me when I'm gone and uh, do whatever I need to right here in the RV when I have the time and energy to do it after working on their deck. Um, so it's glad to be, I'm glad to be with you tonight. And when thinking about how I wanted to present this, I thought, about the presentation I did for Mary May a couple months back that Larry referred to. And I thought, well, I'd want to present 
exactly the material that I presented for Mary. So rather than to uh, try to reinvent the wheel, I'm going to play that recording of Mary's, um, Mary's webinar that I did for her a few months back. And then what I'll do is we'll make it even better by I'll pause at different points of the presentation to give you a chance to ask questions on something that I, I may have just presented. So that's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna see how it goes. And I trust it's gonna be beneficial for you. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get this going. Okay, Larry, if you could enable my screen sharing. I just, I just did. Thank you. with you Mary thanks for the invite this uh, means a lot one thing Mary might not have told you is that she and I share a Dutch heritage okay and she may know the saying but I think it might hold true for us uh, if you ain't Dutch you ain't much <laughs> so uh, I think I'll hold to that Oops. and there's a there's a story that's told as well uh, wondering if you know why uh, Dutch people wear wooden shoes. Do you know that, Mary? Uh, no, what's that? <laughs> well, it's to keep the woodpeckers from picking on our head. <laughs> so that's uh, that goes right along with us Dutch people. All right. So <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Thanks again, Mary. We'll, we'll we'll go through this, and hopefully there won't be any audio issues. If there are, well, we'll just roll with it. That's what happens. Okay, well, okay? so far it sounds like everything sounds good. And, um, oh, excellent. Wonderful. That's that's a relief. Um, now, I, along the way, I'm going to be looking at the chat here, and I will be um, sort of breaking in, hopefully not rudely, but breaking in um, and uh, asking questions along the way. So um, if that happens, um, who knows what direction this can go. You never know. But um, if you want to just start and sort of introduce the, the whole art of chip carving, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, as Mary said, uh, chip carving is an incise style of carving, uh, individual cuts to remove chips. And the style that I'll be showing you today is a European style. Now, I mention that because if you've seen uh, any chip carving videos on YouTube, you'll see a lot of them from Russia and Ukraine. And it's a completely different style of, of chip carving. All right. So we're going to look at the European Swiss style of carving. And that's what I'll be mentioning. But before I show you some of those, the details about chip carving, there's some good reasons why chip carving is an excellent hobby to get into. Uh, first, it's not very expensive. All right, with just a couple of knives and uh, a piece of basswood and a pattern, you can chip carve. As a matter of fact, I put a kit out just recently. It's only $55 to get started. Now, that's pretty rare for a lot of styles of carving. All right, um, along with that, you don't need any artistic ability to be a good chip carver. Uh, you don't have to know how to draw. Uh, uh, you don't have to know how to use a compass or a ruler or a T-square. Now, in the past, you did because we didn't have the technology that's available today where you can print off a pattern and transfer it to your board. So that's why I first started was lots of drawing. Uh, even the letters and numbers were all hand-drawn. But now uh, you, can, uh, you don't need that ability. You can just print it off, and I'll show you how to apply a pattern momentarily. Also, chip carving is really portable. Take it with you on vacation, when you go camping, when you're visiting uh, friends and family. You can chip carve, and um, it won't interrupt any conversation. And so it's nice and portable. Just take it with you in a briefcase or a sack. And um, something else that's encouraging is you can get good results in a relatively short period of time. Uh, develop a good technique, and within a matter of months, you'll be making some pieces that you'll be glad to display and share with others around you. And then finally, 
uh, chip carving is a great way to embellish items that are really usable around your house. Uh, here's a, a double tea light holder that I recently carved. All right, here's a, a knife box, okay, that I embellished the outside with. Oh, that's beautiful. And then uh, here's a plate that I recently carved. And this one you could uh, not only display, but it, to give it as a gift, maybe an anniversary or a graduation gift, you could add lettering on the bottom, dates on the top, or you can do it on the back as well. So it's uh, it's really handy that way. It's um, You can uh, use them yourself or give them away. That's beautiful work. And the details on it are, it's amazing what kind of details you can do with it. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'm going to move the, my camera now, so get ready for a little so trip here. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> nice ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> now you're upside That's... down. <laughs> Whoa, hang on. Yeah, I might want to, everybody might want to close your eyes for a few seconds. I'll let you know when it's good to go. <laughs> Make you all dizzy, huh? Yeah? Okay. Um, how's that? Okay, yes. I can't see what you see. Can you see this entire board? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good. Um, let's uh, first I'll show you the uh, knife that you can that you'll need to get started. This is the basic uh, chip carving knife, a standard cutting knife. And it's designed specifically for chip carving in that the angle of the cutting edge is designed so when it gets a, a nice, nice technique, it's making a nice angled cut into the wood. And also, you'll see it's angled down like this. That's all uh, designed so when you're putting pressure on the blade, all that pressure is, is designed to go right through the point of the knife and down along the cutting edge. Another uh, facet of design with the knives, now these are the My Chip Carving Knives, and when I designed them, there was a couple things I, I insisted on when I made the design, and that is this thumb notch. Okay, the thumb notch, I'm gonna show you coming up how important that is for either a right-hander or a left-hander. All right, so this is a standard cutting knife. I also added a second knife to the knives that I uh, sell, and this is called the modified knife. You'll see there's less metal up on the spine, and it's pointier, and that makes it excellent for curved cuts and detail work. Because when you make a curved cut, you wanna drag as little metal around the curve as possible, and that gives you a much smoother cut than trying to drag all of this metal around a curve. Okay, so that even allows you to carve circles and real tight curves with this modified knife. Now there is a, a third knife that I used to sell and it's a stab knife, but I'm not gonna go over that today because uh, it's really a knife you can get anywhere and it's used just for tiny embellishments in your chip carving. All right, so those are the, the two knives that you'll, you'll find handy. You can start all your chip carving with just one knife, this standard cutting knife. And that's a very, I'm just looking at the edge on that. Can you show back? Um, that's a pretty flat edge, right? Is there a little bit of a curve on it, or is it a pretty flat surface there? It's a flat edge, okay. right. Okay. And it's also, you can look down it, it's very thin, mm -hmm. right? So the thin blade allows you to make nice, smooth, clean cuts with relatively little effort. All right, so that's that's really important. Now, you mentioned, Mary, about the way you do chip carving, well, I wouldn't use this knife if I'm chip carving hardwoods like you are. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. No, that would because make sense. Because it's going to snap. It's going to break for sure. And I wouldn't be able to get the depth just with my hand. So I would go to your technique. I would use chisels and a mallet to do that kind of chip carving in hardwoods. And you're talking, you normally use basswood? Right. I, yeah. So I shouldn't have said hardwoods because basswood is technically a hardwood. Right. But uh, 
I should say dense hard woods. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I mostly use basswood, we'll chip carve butternut, and uh, can do white pine. But I wouldn't suggest these knives for things like maple or oak, things like Plus that. Plus just the effort that it would take to get that through the wood. Not only the, the danger of it breaking, but the, probably just the physical effort that would require to make oh. those cuts. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, really true. Um, there's been a Let's question. look at sharpening. Go ahead. Sorry, there's been a question about sharpening. Oh, you're going to go over sharpening right now? Yeah, okay, right now. Wonderful. Good timing. <laughs> All right. Perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> All right. Uh, when I first started chip carving, I sharpened all my knives with two ceramic stones. All right, uh, about 10 years ago, I knew I could get a better edge on my knives, and I went on the search, okay, reading, researching, trying this, trying that, and this method that uh, I decided on gives me a much better edge than the ceramic stones, okay? These are four different grits of self-adhesive, silicon carbide strips, starting at 1,200 grit, 1,800, 4,500, and 8,000 grit. All right, and here's the technique. I usually do this on the top of a table so it can hang over the edge, so I just put some boards underneath to replicate that idea. You'll lubricate the strips with water okay can you hold on just one minute and maybe back up yep. the camera just a little bit because it's not fully sure. um, all the sides are not fully sure. visible gotcha just so it looks like the, the 1800 is needs to be sort of shifted down um down okay can you see the 1200 now uh, yes yes that's sort of centered in the screen so th is that the one you're going to be using 1200 yes that's where we're okay, going to start that's fine all right, we'll start on the 1200 grit. I lubricated it with water and I'll lay the knife down flat on the surface and raise it up so you could stick maybe a quarter underneath. And what we're doing, we're just going to sharpen the secondary bevel on the edge. There's no sense sharpening the entire surface, just a very small secondary bevel. All right, and we'll push this away 10 times. And then I'll flip it over and raise it up again and come back 10 times. Now, here is the most important step in sharpening. You have to turn a burr or a wire edge on the coarsest grit that you start with. So a wire edge is when these two edges meet and one of the edges will start to slightly curl over. So when I pulled it back 10 times, if these two edges meet, I should have a very fine wire edge that you can feel on the top. If you don't feel that wire edge, go back and do 10 more times. You can count, I'll just do a few of them, but you count 10 across and 10 coming back and then Test it again. Is there a wire edge? And if there is, then you can start counting down. All right. Now, what if you can't get a wire edge? It just doesn't, it's not occurring. Increase the angle a little bit on your knife. That means those two edges have not met yet. Increase the angle a little bit and try again. You have to have a wire edge. Otherwise, all you're doing is you're polishing a dull edge of your knife. That's a very good point. Yeah. Right. Then you would count down. You do nine times and nine. You do eight, eight, all the way down to one, one. Then you turn your board. Spray the water on here. Count ten and ten, nine, nine, all the way down to one and one. And you do that same procedure on the 4,500 grit and the 8,000 grit. Now, once you're done with 8,000 grit, all the way 10 to one, you're going to have a mirror, shiny, sharp edge. And then the final step is to hone the edge with a leather strop. Okay, so you use very similar okay. similar materials than that I use for my uh, carving gouges. 
Um, what what's interesting okay. is what you're talking about is to get it such a so so it's even on each side um, by doing uh, those exact numbers from one side to the other because your each side of the knife is exactly the same. Exactly right. Yeah, that, yeah. That's why we count down an even number all the way down so it stays the same on each side. Okay. To hone your knife. Um, Go ahead. Got a question? Yeah, Go ahead. Just a, a comment. Name the strips again, please. What are those? That is it wet, dry sandpaper? All right. These are self adhesive silicon carbide strips. Now, I'll save you the time in going out trying to find these. All right. And this isn't just a sales point, but it's the truth because I searched long and wide, far and wide to find these strips. It's a 3M product. And I had looked all over before I could find a distributor. And so that's why I, I sell them from my store. I mean, you can go out and look yourself, but I just, I'll save you the time. You're not going to find them. Um, even in auto parts stores, I don't think they go up to 8,000. And I don't think they have self-adhesive. Right. Anything that I've found at auto stores um, are just the, as they are with, with nothing, uh, no sticky back or anything like that. Right. Right. All right. Uh, to hone your knife, which is the last step, I use this white gold compound. Rub it on the surface of your leather strop. And then the same technique. Lay it flat, raise it up a little bit, and we're going to count 10 and 10 all the way down to 1 and 1. And now you've got what I refer to as a scary sharp knife. Keep your fingers away. Because it's going to do the trick. Yeah, it's going to do the trick. All right. Any other questions come through on sharpening before we move um, on? I, I have a question. This is quite often a question that, that uh, students ask me. How often do you have to sharpen it? I mean, I know you're using a relatively soft carving wood, but um, do you have to do it every day or every couple of hours? Thanks for, yeah, that's a point that I get asked a lot too. Good, good question. As long as you use your strop regularly, every 20, 30 minutes while you're carving, you can maintain that scary sharp edge. Only when your strop doesn't return the edge to as sharp as you know it can be, then you go back to the, the sharpening board. Okay. Okay, so you'll, feel, you'll know the difference after carving with a scary sharp knife. You'll know when it's not performing the way that it should. Uh, one more thing I can show you too, to test it, to test your knife, if it's sharp or not, you can go across the end grain of a piece of wood and you should get a glassy smooth cut across the end grain when your knife is really scary sharp. Okay. Um, one quick question. Um, let's see, what surface are the strips adhered to? That's just a piece of wood, isn't it? Or... Oh yeah, another good point. I'm glad that you're raising these questions. This is a this is a piece of quarter inch melamine. Oh, yeah, so very flat. Okay, melamine. Yeah, very flat, and it's a countertop surface, so it is water resistant. Very, very interesting. So you could you, basically you're wanting to find something as smooth and flat as possible, so that you don't have any ridges, you don't get hit bumps or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. I put it all together in a sharpening kit. If you're interested, you can go to my website. Okay, somebody's asking, how about marble or granite as a base? I'm, I'm sure that would work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, granite works really well. I first started selling my kits with uh, glass in it, <laughs> but the Postal Service <laughs> didn't cooperate, and so I quickly switched to melamine. <laughs> now, um, yeah, uh, granite, of course, will work just fine. I don't know marble. Marble probably has more dip granite wood uh, just because it's a little bit softer. But, of course, those are more expensive than melamine. Okay. Well, um, what uh, we need to get your full name, Marty Leanhouts. That's uh, and, and his website is My Chip Carving, right? That's www.mychipcarving. 
Right. And right. My chip carving. Here, I will type. I'll is, type it in. M a r t y l e e. It's L e e n h a u t s. H o u t s. H o u t s. I'm glad I'm <laughs> reading that out. Hold on. Uh, okay, and it's my chip carving. Can't type. Okay, Marty Leanhouse, mychipcarving.com. Okay. All right. All right. This may be a good stop uh, point to stop, and I'll just jump in because often there are a lot of questions about sharpening. Now, Mary brought up some of the most common ones. Maybe you have some other ones that that come to mind. And if you do, go ahead, ask away, and I can answer them now. We won't wait long, like, like Larry mentioned, sometimes uh, questions come up afterwards, and if they do about a previous topic, feel free to answer, ask them, but if you do have one now, we'll, uh, we'll entertain it, otherwise we'll move ahead. I guess, Marty, one question is, when you uh, are sharpening them, you start at 10 and 10, then 9 and 9, and 8 and 8. Um, what's the purpose of that versus like 50 and 50? Oh yeah, the purpose is to um, even out as you count down so that you're continually making the burr smaller and smaller as you go. If you were to do 50 on one side and then 50 on the other, you'd have a burr that's been generated by 50 strokes. Whereas if you count down from 10 10, 9, 9, you're ending with 1 and 1, which is removing a very, very fine burr. So the burr keeps getting smaller, smaller, finer, and finer as you work down and count down. Gotcha. Thanks. Mark, Marty, I've got a question. This is Larry Wade. When you uh, give up on rehoning, you have to go back to the grits. Do you always go back to the 1200 or can you go to a higher uh, a higher grit and not have to go through the entire four sequence again? Right, it's not uh, necessary all the time to go start at 1200. Maybe you wanna start at 4500 and count down uh, maybe even six to one and then count down six to one on 8000 and then hone again and that may bring you back to your scary sharp edge. So it all depends on, uh, I guess, how bad the edge has gotten. Okay, we'll move ahead. And he also has an online school with videos um, uh, similar to what I have. Okay, um, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. That's Carry all right. On. That's fine. Yeah, questions are, are perfect. Ask, ask them any time. Uh, Marty, what's the size of the uh, board? If you have a sharp knife, all you need to get get going now is to put a pattern on a piece of basswood. Yeah, the, pattern, right? the pattern's about four by four, so I guess that board's probably six by six. And okay, can we, we hold out? Can here's we, can how we it's hold done. Out one second. Uh, yeah. st uh, we still have a question about the um, the sharpening before we go too far past this. Um, I don't want to backtrack. Yeah. Um, do you have the burr on each of the four steps? Do you re reacquire the burr or do you actually take it off at each of the steps? All right. What's going to happen is when you feel the burr, 1200 grit. Then you know you can start counting down, and that burr gets tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier, okay, until it's finally so small at 8,000 grit. These two edges are meeting, but you're not going to be able to feel the burr. So you're not, re, um, you're not bringing the, the burr, that wire edge, back on each grit. Well, technically, you are but you're not going to be able to right. feel it. Okay. Okay. 
So in the process yeah. of it, that's when the, the wire edge goes just as you go to the increased grit, it slowly just wears, wears it down uh, to nothing. It disappears. So you don't actually see yeah, it. it you don't see it. Because sometimes with my carving gouges, you can actually see the string of metal that comes off. Right. But you, you probably wouldn't do that right. with this because it's a lot more gentle uh, of a process. So, um. And actually, at 1,200 grit, in the video that I have on my website, I even think it's in my this course I just released, I when I demonstrated, I actually – peeled off a very fine piece of metal, which was the burr. Okay. And you can see it when the light reflects on it, but it's very, very fine. Now, of course, if we started on 600 grit, oh, you're gonna easily and quickly feel the, the burr because it's gonna be very coarse. But we start at 1200 where you can still feel it and then as you work through the grits, when we get to 8,000 or even 4,500, you are not going to be able to feel the burr. It's just too fine. Okay. So at that point, it's really just more refining that edge. Yeah, your edges are still meeting, but you can't feel the burr because it's you're polishing that edge so much with these very fine grits that that edge is getting sharper and sharper and sharper. Mm, wonderful. Oh, those are great, great answers. I mean, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> this is this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. All right, pattern application. Um, there are three different ways and more than you can ways you can apply a pattern onto your wood. You can hand draw it, like I mentioned before. You can put it down and trace it using graphite transfer paper. There is another way, I won't explain it, but it's done with an inkjet printer. But the way I'm going to show you is done with a pattern transfer tool, which is a heat transfer method, and done with a pattern that's printed on either a photocopy machine or a laser printer. All right, if you have an inkjet printer at home, take that pattern and go to Staples or Kinko's or the library and make a photocopy of it because it has to be printed with a powdery substance called toner. All right, this was from my laser printer and it has toner on it, a black powder. And what we're going to do is we're gonna reheat this toner and transfer it to the wood. Okay, so I'll put it face down, I'll tape a hinge. This pattern transfer tool has been plugged in for quite a long time, so it's really hot. So I'm gonna to have to move pretty quickly, otherwise you will burn the wood if you don't move fast enough. So that's when it's really so that's hot. That's basically kind of it's like an iron, but it's more focused uh, because I've I've right. used an iron before, but if your wood has any variation on the surface, it's not gonna transfer. So the, the fact that it's smaller. Right. Uh, oh yeah, okay, fascinating. That looks like an upholstery tool. Yeah, so this is a direct, intense heat, and you can see how quickly it heats up the toner from the paper and transfers it to peel it up as I go, not only so I can see where I've been, but also I think it helps release the toner from the paper onto the wood. And just like that, anybody timing me, maybe 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. It's ready to go, and we're ready to carve. That's great, and also does the, only... the half the half tone and the grays also. Yeah, it does. Yeah, whatever the toner is like on your pattern, that's what's going to show up on the wood. If, of course, if you're carving letters or numbers, you make a mirror image of your pattern, so it's the right way when it's transferred on. <laughs> yeah, that would be an interesting <laughs> sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we use this for all of our pattern application here. Uh, it's just exclusively. It's the only way to go. It's fast, it's easy, and it's repeatable. Wonderful. Yeah, I've used that method a bit, um, but I don't have a, uh, that kind of photocopier. So, yeah, you do have to make sure that your photocopier is really good quality toner. And um, I've also seen that method of using acetone or um, lacquer thinner. Have you tried that? I have. I've tried uh, uh, lacquer and acetone. 
That's where you put the pattern down and then you wet the back with acetone or lacquer thinner. It's harder. It's, it takes more technique to get a good transfer. At least that's what I found. It gets a little, using lacquer a little messy thinner. too and smelly. Yeah, right, right. So when I wanted to present something to my students and my customers, I wanted the easiest foolproof method and that's the pattern transfer tool. Okay, we've got a few questions happening here. Um, uh, what is the size of the head on the transfer tool? Perhaps a nickel? Can you look at that? Uh, yeah, maybe a dime. Okay. okay. Three quarters. Yes, and there's a comment here. Uh, time to buy a laser printer. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and while you're while you're at that, um, they're not very expensive, really. Uh, you can get them on sale for about uh, seventy yeah, bucks. Yeah, I, I know. And the toner lasts a long time. And does it, it does it matter the quality of uh, just as long as it's toner? Or, uh... Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't buy the brand name toner. I just buy the generic. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, I normally use carbon paper, but for the patterns that you're talking about, they're so precise and they're so detailed, uh, this type of transferring is, is really critical for the, the amount of design that you have on there. Okay, let's see. How does one, um, hold on a second, we got a question here. How does one do the mirror image of text? Is it an option in Microsoft Word? Well, that's more of a print um, where you can do a mirror image, I think, in the print dialog box. Um, uh, yeah, some printers have that in the dialog. Not, not the one that I have doesn't have it. So um, I've got a video that shows how to mirror image uh, items uh, that's on my website. But it's it's really easy if you use a PC. You can do it in the <clears throat> excuse me, can do it in the Paint program. <clears throat> Or if you're taking it to a photocopy center, they do have the mirror image print function on the photocopy machines. Right. Yeah, you just have to be creative with how to get it reversed. <laughs> you might be able to, no, I was going to say in a Microsoft Word program, you might be able to reverse the text, but I'm not quite sure about that. I have to, have to see about that. Yeah, you can if, you use, um, if you're using Microsoft Word there's the, and you use Word Art. You can take a word art letter lettering and flip it. Right. Okay. Make it into an actual image rather than text. Mm hmm Yep. Okay. All right. Ready to go on? Yep. I think so. All right. Let's talk technique. Um, holding the knife is crucial for chip carving technique. When you lay the knife on your fingers and just gently curl your fingers around the handle, the thumb notch is where the joint of your thumb is positioned. Okay, so the joint of your thumb fits right into this notch. Not the tip of your thumb, but the joint of your thumb. And this notch has been ground at 60 degrees. So when you put your thumb down, a knuckle or two down, this forms a 55 to 65 degree angle with the wood. Can you see that okay? Yes, that shows up very quickly. Okay. This angle is about 55 to 65 degrees. And every time I pick up the knife and put my joint of my thumb in the notch and I put my hand on the board, I'm going to form that same consistent angle. And that's what we're looking for in good chip carving technique. All right. Notice my thumb is always in contact with the handle of the of the knife. This is also it's safe carving. As soon as my thumb gets out here, now it's fair game, right? We're not carving apples. All right, but if your thumb is loose, and you get, you're in the habit of hooking on the end of the board and pulling, now you can cut yourself. But as long as your thumb is like this, using good technique, you can't cut anything on this hand. It's impossible. Your free hand, just keep it behind the sharp edge and you'll be good. So I, I'm always asked, well, how many times have you cut yourself? 
and I've been chip carving for 35 years, and I've never cut myself. Now that's a good statistic. <laughs> yeah, uh, zero is always good, right, when it comes to cuts. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I stress, too, don't ever point uh, the gouge towards yourself, no matter what you're doing. <laughs> but it sounds like what you're doing. Exactly. I'm always nervous about using knives like that because of the fact that it's so easy to cut yourself. But, no, what you're showing is it's an excellent technique in just keeping everything away. Mm hmm And you'll notice also the knife handle of a knife, I sort of cock my wrist out a little bit so that the handle of knife is more in line with my forearm. Okay, this just keeps it in a nice firm position. So if I'm making straight cuts, whereas like this, <clears throat> now I'm pulling across my body, <clears throat> but just hook your hand a little bit, hook your wrist, and now we can make nice straight cuts. But that's something you'll get the hang of as you as you do more and more chip carving. The only time any of my students have cut themselves, I'll, I'll give you a little heads up, is when uh, one student was talking with his hands like this, <laughs> <laughs> and he cut his free hand, okay? Another time in class, a student had their knife sitting on their lap on the carving lap board, and it slipped off the the board and unfortunately the guy next to him was wearing flip-flops oh, no. and so you know where that went to uh he just sliced thankfully it was just his little toe that got a slice in it and uh it could have been worse yes. right <laughs> don't yeah and don't, uh, don't wear sandals in your workshop no matter what you're carving <laughs> <laughs> right right and also um i've started and i ever since this happened i always have my students carve on a lap board, which is just a a big quarter inch hard board or MDF that I, I give them to put across their lap. Because if they were to slip off a little piece they were carving, they could cut themselves on their thigh or something like that. So now instead, I always use a board. I've got one right below here. I, it won't fit on the screen though. It's just a big piece of quarter inch MDF that they can, medium density fiberboard, that they can set on their lap and then put their piece they're carving on top of a stable base. And it's also a safety factor and too. And that, um, that uh, like a drawer pad underneath it that just holds it against whatever material you're putting it onto? Right, right. This is a no slip mat. This is actually a tool line here that I, I also give out to my students and we use because yeah, it, it keeps it positioned so you don't have to feel like you're holding on to it as you're cutting. Uh, we use this for all straight cuts and gradual curves. But straight curves, we, we take this out so we can turn the board and I'll show you that coming up in just right. a second. And because you're actually pressing into the wood, you're actually pressing it into that pad also. So it's not like you're pulling right. necessarily, but it's actually pressing all right, this is a good point for me to, to mention something, and that is uh, since this webinar with Mary, I've upgraded the no-slip mat because I found a better surface, a better uh, no-slip surface from my distributor that doesn't have all those little holes in it because that was really annoying because my chips would get stuck in those little tiny holes and I was forever trying to get them out of there. Um, so this new surface, it's a little thicker, little spongier, and it doesn't have the, the holes on the top. It's much a much better no slip surface. So that's one thing I've upgraded. And also I've started carving on a turntable a Lazy Susan with the no slip mat attached to the top of the Lazy Susan. And it's just been a huge, a huge improvement for um, efficient and economic chip carbon because you're continually turning your work. And with the turntable, oh, it just spins around so nicely. Um, if you have to carve straight lines, you just hold it in place and carve a straight line. But all these curves, like on this rosette for this board I'm carving, you just make a cut and you spin it around and make the second cut. 
So that's a couple things uh, that I've upgraded since this webinar. Any questions at this time? into that that's interesting um, there's a, a real exactly. quick question here do you suggest beginners use a Kevlar glove on the left hand no it's not necessary because you keep it away yep some uh, get a little fearful they think their thumb is too close to the cutting edge but it you don't need a thumb guard here either it's not necessary because you can't cut your thumb it's it's just not possible and no, I don't recommend any glove on the opposite hand. Just keep it out of harm's way. Okay. I start uh, my students carving on this material. This is high density urethane. It's a, a trademark product called Easy Board. All right, this material doesn't have any grain it's a consistent density and it's softer than basswood. Now I use this so that my students can develop good technique and not have to worry about uh, getting the right enough depth on basswood or fighting the grain. So we start on this. Okay, it's a high density. This is a sign maker material. Right. If you've seen fancy signs outside of restaurants and hotels, they're made from high density urethane. And you that's not a you can't if you press into it, it doesn't dent. It's very it's it's Oh yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah, it's not like insulation foam. Okay, it's really dense. This is a twenty pound per cubic foot density, this tan material. Basswood starts at about twenty pounds a cubic foot. The very softest basswood you'd find down south that we don't like to carve. Mm -hmm. Um the better basswood will be up in the upper 20s and 30 pound per cubic foot range. Right, and that's usually the so ones that, you, uh, that are that grow in you know northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, New that's York. Right. Yeah, I'm, that's right. You, know, you, you want to stay. Yeah, we're in the prime basswood, prime basswood country up yeah, here. Yeah, you want to stay away from the the Georgia, North Carolina uh, basswood. It gets a little stringy. Mm-hmm. I'm going to show you good technique and we're going to carve a few two-sided chips. Okay, again, thumb in the notch of the handle and you're forming a tripod with a thumb and looks like I've got maybe two knuckles down, forms a stable base no matter how I turn my hand or how the board turns. Okay, so I start here on this chip. It starts very shallow, gets a little bit deeper in the middle because this is a, it's a small little chip. Turn the board, and now on this side, I make the same cut on the other side, and when those two cuts meet in the bottom, the chip will come out. All right, I'm going to get a little closer. Sound good, Mary? Uh, yes. No, that's it's showing up well, but yeah, if you can do some close-up. I'll move the camera a little closer. Yep, Is that better? Fine. It's pretty clear. Okay. Um, there's a, I'll there's, show you there's again. a quick question here. Um, somebody has the uh, wood handled more chip knife from chipping away and it doesn't have the 60 degree thumb notch. And should I file one in? Uh, should you adjust the actual um, the knife itself if it doesn't have that notch? I would encourage it, sure. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to just show it where, where that actually is? Um, it's so right it's, up here. It's right there, okay. It's it's 60 degrees from the, how do I describe it? <laughs> Here's the 60 degrees, all right? You want to form 60 degrees, 55 to 65, somewhere in that range, from here to here. So it's got to be the same on this okay. side. Okay. Okay, I hope that that uh, explains that. Yeah. Let's see if there's more questions. But all right, thank you. Yep. As you get near the edge of your piece, you want to keep the base, so slide another piece of material right alongside, and I'll do a larger two-sided chip. Shallow to start with. The widest part of the chip is where you need the deepest part of your cut.
And when carving easy board, I can just make a nice smooth cut and concentrate on my technique. Is my thumb staying down? Knuckles down, am I getting a good consistent angle? And you can tell if the angle is consistent if both cuts meet right in the center of that chip. If it's moved off to one side or the other, that means your angle has changed on the cut. Here's another two-sided chip. These are shaped like a canoe. The line down the middle helps me visualize where the point of the knife will read cut. Okay, can you hold on just one second? I've got a comment here that says um, no sound. Just want to make sure that things are working correct. Everybody, can everybody hear both of our voices? Um, do you want to just say something just a sure. second, and we'll okay. sure give it a sound check. Okay, no, nope. sounds perfect. Okay, okay, it might be in a local issue. So okay, we're good. Continue on, please. All right, sounds <laughs> we're, good. We're fine. Same cut on the opposite side. Watch my thumb this time as I make this cut. Start shallow. There's the deepest part. And I draw it out. My thumb never left the surface of the material. And that's going to give me a good, consistent cut from there to there. So you actually, I'm looking at the, the positioning of your hand. You're starting steep, steeper. And then as you continue it, you start to sort of flatten it out. You pull it, you, you actually, actually, position of your hand lowers down. Is that correct? Um, so it starts a high, and then as you drag it, am I, am I, it's hard, it might be hard to see from this angle. Yeah, let's do another one and, and see what you think. All right, so I start here. My thumb and knuckles are down. Shallow. There's the deepest part. Now I'm pushing down on the knife right from here, right from my index finger. And I finish right there. Now the other side. The angle of the knife, the cutting edge, stays pretty much the same throughout. At the end, I may drop it down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think that's what I was just seeing. Finish. Okay, I think that's what yeah, I was yeah. seeing, just as you finish it up so it gets a nice sharp corner. Right. I don't need to drag it out and risk slipping off the end. Okay. Okay. So those are two-sided chips. Uh, let's let me jump over to basswood. Okay. Um, there's a, a quick question here. Is there a difference between chip carving and relief carving? Um, yes. Uh, do you want to answer that? And um, uh, I can answer that also. But well, feel free. Go ahead. Yeah. Why don't okay. you answer well, that, Mary? Basically, what I interpret. A relief carving is where you actually have the carving itself raised up and the background lowered down. Uh, this is more of that incised carving. Um, it's it, you can also call it sort of a sunken relief. Um, you know, there's there's several words for it, but it's uh, it's not really technically relief carving. And is that how you interpret that, also, Marty? Right, and you can you can do uh, chip carving as a positive image, which would be more like relief carving, except in chip carving you're making individual cuts, whereas I'd say in relief carving you're doing more multiple cuts to create, remove the background to create the image. Is that how you'd you'd understand uh, it yes. too? Yeah, you're a lot of the chip carving ends up being more pattern based like what you're talking about with this more um, and then th those repeat patterns like what you were looking at right now and but but again incised but not an actual independent shape that is carved but yeah I mean it's, it's hard to explain right. but yes sure sure all right Larry it's been about an hour so maybe folks want to stretch a little bit fill their fill their drink cup and Take a break. Yeah, let's do that. There'll be a couple of questions in the chat room you can take a look at, or I'll repeat them um, after we get back. It's uh, let's just four minutes. Let's come back at, at the hour. Okay.
<clears throat> see her back there. It's Gary Hensley. I did make it. Let's see, I didn't hear that. Hey, Larry. It's Gary Hensley. I did make it. Oh, Gary, hey, they're good. It's Gary Henslow, Hensley, camping out in Morro Bay. I guess not quite camping, huh? Well, in my motorhome, it is camping of sorts, and it's fun. It's cool tonight, so it's good. Oh, good. <clears throat> So Marty, I can only see your screen. I'll, can you hear me okay? Yes, just fine. So the chat had a couple of questions uh, as we went along. It's for the matting, would neoprene work? I'll just let you kind of think about the, would neoprene work? What is the name of your new non-slip product? Where do you purchase Easy Board? And I point out you can buy it at your website, easycarving.com, but you can talk about your two websites. Is there a local source? Um, someone said, I think Dashboard is his brand and sold on Easy Carving. What is the size of the sharpening board? And then to clarify, are you stropping after each count on the sandpaper? So those were the those are the questions. They're in the they're in the chat room. They're in the chat. Okay, so let's go, let's get back, Marty. Let's say it's eight o'clock our time, but 10 your time. All right, Larry, let's, let's might as well answer those questions. Why don't you just go ahead and we'll take them one at a time. Okay, so it, would neoprene work as a uh, anti-skid product underneath your work as, an, as a, another anti-slip uh, device support? Yeah, I don't know. I, I've not used it. So I really can't comment on that. Okay. What is the name of your non your new non-slip product? Uh, it's called, I think it's called VersaMath. I get it from a distributor and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know much more than that. I don't know how it's normally used but it's a nice thick material. I'd say it's almost three sixteenths of an inch thick, which is really nice. And boy, I don't know. I, I never saw anything like it before when I tested it out and I'm really enjoying it. Okay. And can you speak momentarily a little bit about your two websites and which one that would be listed on? Sure. Mychipcarbing.com is where you'll find everything related to basswood, chip carving, knives in my store. You'll find the turntables, you'll find the no-slip mats, and you'll find um, lots of instructional material, uh, videos, patterns, and courses that I'm working on. Now, uh, the goals of my chip carving have been to inspire, to instruct, and equip ever since I started in 2007. And I try to carry that out. I've stuck to it. So equipping is done through the store. Everything I think that you'll need is found there, along with kits. So that if you're just beginning and want to start, there is a kit that can meet your budget requirements and get you started. Um, and all the kits include one or more courses so you can learn how to chip carve correctly. Um, okay. there, there are two memberships. The Ruby membership, which includes the chip carving essentials course. All right, that's the basic. And then a platinum membership includes everything I have to offer. All videos, all patterns, all courses and a monthly live webinar that breaks down to $10 a month. So I think it's, I've tried to make it affordable for everyone and then uh, some way to allow you to learn how to chip carve and to really enjoy this great hobby. 
at easycarving.com, and that's E and the letter Z, carving.com, you'll find uh, the Easy Board product. Now, I know the question is coming up. Where can I get it locally? I And I can't answer that. Excuse me. Except uh, if you check with sign making shops, you can probably get some scraps from them, but I can't guarantee it's gonna be the same product that I sell. When I got into selling high density urethane, I got samples from three or four different manufacturers and I settled on this product, which is, it's called Cora Foam, C-O-R-A, foam. That's the, the manufacturer's name for this product, Cora Foam. I trademarked the Easy Board name because I'm introducing it to the, the carving world, whether that's caricatures or relief carving or chip carving. Basically, any type of carving you like to do, you can do it in Easy Board. Uh, it takes any type of finish and uh, like I say, no grain to deal with. So it's 100% carvable material. So at easycarving.com, you also find some lessons and a few patterns. And you can order whatever size and shape you like, and I'll prepare that for you. Hey, Marty, two other Those questions. Are my... The other question, what is the size of the sharpening board? 10 by 10, melamine. And the that fits the strips just perfectly. And the second other related question on, on stropping, do you strop after each count on each grit or do you strop just at, after you go through all four grits? Stropping after you've gone through all four grits because that is the honing process. So honing is different than sharpening and honing is done to maintain the scary sharp edge. Okay, that's the end of the questions that I see. So you can keep going. All right, thanks, Larry. All right, let's do these two-sided uh, chips on basswood. And I'll start here. We'll do some of these, these large, long ones. Okay. Um, if you cut too deep on one side, you end up with a furrow in the bottom. How do you deal with that? I'm guessing you're probably going to go over that on this section, right? Because that's probably more of an issue with wood. Okay, let's, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. All right. Now, what you're asking is, what if you undercut too much in through here and you create a furrow? With my students, my beginning courses, I don't concentrate that at all. What I prefer is for them to get make two clean cuts where the chip comes out and not really worry much about undercutting too deep. Usually that's not a problem when you're first beginning. Most likely the problem you'll have when you first start is not cutting deep enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is the brand name of that high density polyurethane carving board? It's called Easy Board. Full disclosure, <laughs> that's the trade name I gave it, and it's it's distributed at my Easy Carving website. So, again, it's one of those things. I got it and I started distributing it because you can't get it in small pieces or cut to shape. If you go to a sign shop and ask them for a, a five by 12 by three eighths piece of high density urethane, they're gonna laugh at you. You know, they're not gonna do that. Uh, you'd have to buy a four by eight sheet of half inch easy board and who wants to pay that? So I decided to pay it and uh, and I just cut it up and, and, uh, and distribute and it. And does have the pattern on it as a, sort of a practice board? We can do that. It's an option.
when I first start teaching chip carving with my students, I don't deal with grain issues. But that is something that we eventually get to because it's just part of the nature of carving wood. All as right? shallow as those These cuts are, it seems like you don't really have to worry about it as much if it were if, as if you were doing uh, much larger, deeper cuts. Does it make a difference? Yeah, I think so. Um, I go over when you have to pay attention to the grain, especially what's called short grain. Um, short grain in wood is where you experience chip out in chip carving. I'll show you in just a second. Okay. Um, and there's a question, uh, what or how do you control stopping the cut and not go past the pattern? Sure. Okay, right here, I'm at the end. Okay, with my thumb down and knuckles down, I'm not just pulling it freehand. So I've got a good base and I can stop it right there. And then when I reach the other end, this is what Mary observed earlier. To avoid going past the end, I just rock the handle down a little bit to finish the cut. That way you don't risk slipping off the end. Right. So every single one of your cuts is very controlled. There's nothing that is just uh, loose and or you you are in control of every movement and and that's important because if you feel like you're out of control then it's going to slip a lot further. You got that right. Okay, on detail carvings with cuts close together, how do you decide which cuts to make first? And that's probably talking yeah. about uh, grain direction and, and that type of thing. Right, right. And we can only, you know, answer so much <laughs> yeah. of this in just an that hour. That could be another hour but just I'll answering explain. that question. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I've, got, and I've got plenty of videos to help you with these challenges because they're real. You know, they're challenges that everyone experiences. So that's what I hope to accomplish by putting out videos and teaching people how they can get good results with their chip carving. Now, this cut, if you can see the grain in this piece of basswood, it runs this direction. Okay, this cut is pretty much straight across the grain. Here's my next uh, chip to take out. In between these two chips is what's called short grain. Short grain is weak because there aren't many fibers in the wood holding this together. Short grain is where you'll experience chip out. So with that in mind, my next cut should be angled away from this chip, angled away from the short grain area. Mm -hmm. All right, and I'll, we'll do one the way it's supposed to be done and then I'll do one the way it's not supposed to be done. Okay, so I'm angled away from the short grain, angled away from the chip I just took out, and I'm not going to get any chip out along here because I made the first cut in that direction. Basically, the pressure of that Second cut, cut is away from that fragile area. Right, right. And there's my second cut to remove the chip. Everything is preserved. If I made this cut in the, the next cut to remove this chip, if I made it in the wrong direction, maybe I make this outside cut first. Now I'll probably get a little carried away here so that it's sure to happen, okay? If I really cut in here, can you see what's happening in there? I don't know if you can or not. It's sort of lifting a bit. But yeah, it's lifting up through here. All right, and then I come back and maybe my knife is dull and I, I don't know if I can make it happen or not. But it's weak under there, can take it for that. But it didn't happen, but if they were back to back and I made cuts in the wrong direction, you're gonna get chip out. Let me, uh, let me show you. Let's do it this way. Kind of 
kind of mesmerizing watching you. <laughs> kind of hypnotic. <laughs> <laughs> Where a chip out will often happen is where these two cuts meet in the end. Right out there, you know, that's what happens in a short grain area. You get ugly chip out. <laughs> uh, that's one thing that we, we all, whenever we do any chip carving, I want to show you how to avoid chip out. Part of it's a good sharp knife and then proper technique on the order of cuts to avoid these kind of things and that's what I'm glad to glad to teach you because nobody likes that especially when you're right near the end of your carving <laughs> yes <laughs> and you get a chip out it can be like oh so frustrating and that's when you right. uh, get the little teeny bit of super glue <laughs> <laughs> and you're sure to put your knife down <laughs> and walk away. <laughs> yes. How do you how do you know when you're done carving? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's how right there. <laughs> All right. How about three corner chips? All right. I'll show you an easy board here to start with. How about I show you a real big one to yeah, start with? Yeah. <laughs> let's, keep, let's start with a little, little one. Let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah, and then I'll show you a big one coming up. Now these are three identical cuts because this is an equilateral triangle. And you'll notice I didn't even have to move my thumb. Okay, watch again. So you don't have to worry at all about Oops. grain direction. Not at all when you're carving on high density oh, urethane. Oh, well, this is a high density, sorry. I was thinking that was a wood. Okay. Yep. But even even in the um, in the wood, um, because you're actually pressing kind of into the wood, the, the, you actually can probably get away with not necessarily going in that exact grain direction because the cuts are are into the wood. Does that make sense? Is, is that correct? Yeah, you can you can get away with carving against the grain in basswood. Yep. And because of the technique That's why, uh, yeah. of using the, the small blade that just, um, the pressure of that is right into the wood. Yeah. yeah, it's nice and thin too, so you're not putting a lot of pressure to cause wood to chip out in areas that you don't want it to come out of. Okay, so those are some three corner chips in high density. And I'll show you, you can make some really large, nice chips in high density urethane that you can do some great, great and would, big would carvings you not be if able you like. to do that uh, deep in the basswood? can, but it takes a, a different technique. Okay. Uh, some some different techniques that I that I show how to remove large chips in basswood. Well, that can be uh, your your next guest appearance. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Here's some uh, basswood. So you don't really need to, even a small one like that, you don't need to consider grain direction at all. It's just going, going around and rotating it. You do, it's helpful to consider grain direction just to make any straight in line with the grain cuts, mm -hmm. not your last cut. Right. Yep. Okay. Now, if it doesn't make sense, you don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we can get pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> I, ex I explain it in my lessons and you'll understand it after I explain it. But for now, don't worry about it. All three cuts will meet in the center of these little triangles right down there. And when they do, the chip comes out, comes out cleanly. Here's a pattern consisting of almost entirely three corner chips separated by lines. Okay. Um, when you're first starting, I always suggest you do one chip at a time. You do one and then you go on to the next one. Reason being, if something doesn't go right on this one, you can make the needed adjustments on the next one. If you were to do a whole row 
of three corner chips and make repeat cuts, which is what you'll do eventually with your chip carving. But if you were to do this and you made a mistake on one of the cuts, maybe you change the angle on the cut, then you're gonna find that you're gonna have a whole row of three corner chips where you didn't really learn anything because it's gonna be the same mistake repeated every single time. Thumb and knuckles haven't left the board. Okay. Three corner chips. Isn't that beautiful? And it really, the, the light um, just catches that shadow when you have um, just that inverted pyramid type shape. If you, if you get the light shining yeah. on one side, it will end up um, really showing beautiful shadow. Yeah, good point. And the question is often asked, well, why, why 55 to 65 degrees? And it's, it's for that very reason. It's because of the shadow. If we were to carve these at 40 degrees, there's not going to be much shadow at all in the bottom. It's going to sort of blend into the background. If we carve them at 80 degrees, pretty steep, right? You're going to get a lot of shadow in the bottom, but you're going to have a very hard time removing the chips, right. mm -hmm. especially when they get bigger. Can you, uh, these big chips, if I were to try to carve them at 80 degrees, I'm going to go right through the back because right. <laughs> they're not going to meet on um, the thickness of this board. You're going to make your life difficult. That's for sure. Okay, just uh, want to catch up on some questions here. Um, let's see. Detail, let me just catch up. Uh, some wood is more brittle. I heard that moistening the wood with, a, with alcohol and water mixture helps. And then another comment, maybe have the alcohol and then it won't be as bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe not. Sharp tools and alcohol. <laughs> not a great combination. Um, okay. And so have you ever heard yeah, of that, using, a, can, using alcohol to soften? Yeah, yeah you can um, sort of add moisture to your wood as you carve with a 50-50 mixture of alcohol and water. Um, I have never really found the need I can remember one time I had a piece of basswood that was, it was pretty ornery. And at that, that time I sprayed and then carved and it did help. But uh, if you're having trouble, go ahead and uh, yeah, give it a try. Okay. Uh, do you have reference manuals or how, um, or how to books on your site? You, you do, don't you? On your, you've written, have you written a book? Yes, you have. I thought so. Yeah, but, and just so happens I have one sitting uh, right here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote my own book, Chip Carving Essentials, and it goes over uh, technique, sharpening, wood grain, uh, different different shapes to remove, how to apply the pattern, and so on, finishing, and it has a few patterns in the back. Nice. A beautiful. I love the symmetry of these of these patterns. Um, okay. Any tips for cleaning? This is a good question. Any tips for cleaning up remaining pattern lines when you're done without losing the crispness of the edges of the from the sanding? Now, this was actual ink that was put onto that. Is there a way to remove anything remaining? Yep. This is toner, and to remove extra toner that's on the surface of the wood. I suggest you use a Tombow sand eraser. Okay, here's why. The Tombow sand eraser, it takes off the pattern lines that are left, but it doesn't destroy any sharp edges. What is that? Uh, what okay, is the material? You, is it an actual, like a pencil eraser? Or is that it says it says on most some of them it says typewriter eraser. You remember what a typewriter is? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Now, now it's not your old school typewriter eraser that I remember, which were like little rocks. You remember those things? And you'd erase on a piece of paper. I'm dating myself. You er you erase on a typewritten piece of paper, and it actually makes a hole yes, in your paper. Yes, yeah, yeah, great way to erase too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so that's this is not like those. Okay, this breaks away. Okay, you can even see it. See the eraser in there? It broke okay. away. As it removes the the pattern transfer lines, it breaks away, and so it won't take away any of the sharp edges you've carved. I need to try that for, for example. Um, I need to try that for the um, carbon paper. Would that remove carbon paper lines? Mm -hmm. Yep, it sure does. Exactly. Okay, I need to make note of that. I've got all these things on my website. I mean, I don't sound like I'm just here to promote my website, but you're not going to find the Tombow Sandy erasers in the Office Depot store. Um, they're just not out there. It almost sounds like it's a, a Japanese. It almost sounds like it's a, a part sandpaper. Yeah, it's a soft, softer um, material so all your car. So right here, I'm carving a nice sharp edge between these two chips. Oh, I could just sit here and watch this forever. I know we've sort of gone about 10 minutes past our uh time but I don't want to stop yeah. <laughs> and there's still quite, quite a few people are yeah. watching so uh, this is so this Tombow yeah. yeah sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. um, the, the Tombow you'd use to remove the pattern transfer line on top of that ridge if I took sandpaper mm -hmm. and sanded this it's going to flatten off that ridge and we don't want to do that so and we could talk finishing and we could talk other techniques and there's so much so much you can do with chip carving that uh, I've, I never run out of ideas or patterns or things to teach and I guess that's what makes it uh, interesting yeah well it's pretty much unlimited um, well uh, would you consider coming back again in uh, a couple weeks because I've, I've really enjoyed sure, this Mary. and um, I'm, I'm everybody else did there's been some really good comments um, very encouraging um, and I'll, I'll share those with you because you're probably not actually seeing the comments but um, yeah I think this is really good information and now do you want to just quickly show and explain how you ended up doing that now, the one that's on the uh, picture right now uh, did you, you carved it oh. after you finished it is that what yeah yeah, this one, I uh, real quickly, I applied a gel stain first onto the wood, not an oil penetrating stain, a gel stain, because that will dry on the surface. So I applied a gel stain to the entire carving, then I applied the pattern with my pattern transfer tool, and then I carved it. Right. The good thing about that, too, to remove the extra pattern lines, you just use a little bit of lacquer thinner, just moisten it a little bit, and they wipe right off. Hmm, that's beautiful. It really it does a wonderful contrast. That is beautiful. Yeah, it's fun. See all the little circles? Yeah. <laughs> that's, where the, that's where the modified knife comes in handy. Um, carve around the circles and you can, the the thing is there's so many different patterns you can do do it based on that square you can do circular patterns um really really awesome well i just wanted to um remind everybody this is marty leanhouts i'm hoping i'm pronouncing your name right leanhouts right yep. and um right. his he's got an online school his website is um mychipcarving.com so take a look um and really talented, talented person with all this detail, my goodness. Uh, how many years have you been doing this? 
I based it on the time when my daughter was born is when I started, and she happens to be 35 years old. Ah, so. Okay. <laughs> well, really beautiful and great information, but I would definitely uh, like to see you back again, and we can talk more, maybe more about finishing um, and... Uh, lettering. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How about lettering? Oh, I, there I love you go. our letters. <laughs> okay. Sort of uh, wet people's appetite there. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just unending. It's just great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you joining me and us and uh, this live stream. And um, I could just continue on and on. Um, but it's some point <laughs> we need to stop um all right i'll i'll switch over from this screen to the other one all right the the knife i was using there's my diamond deluxe chip carving knife all right so i have two levels of knives ruby knives and diamond the ruby knives are have a blade. They're all shaped the same, but the ruby knife blade is a little bit thicker. All right, and that's for the beginning chip carver so that if they use technique a little bit wrong or pry the chips, the blade won't break. So the diamond blades are super thin and they come in either a bow coat handle or diamond deluxe with what now has a bloodwood handle and they have beautiful mosaic pins. So both diamond knives have the identical same blades. It's only the handle that differs. So that's the two levels of knives that I have right now. And you can read the reviews about them because you don't have to take my word for it. See what people say about the knives. And I think um, I think you'll enjoy, enjoy them and check out the kits and I'd love to have you sign up on my website so that I can keep in touch with you by email. All right. So that's mychipcarving.com. You'll see a spot to sign up either for just the newsletter. Uh, I can get a few free patterns. And, um, if you want to become a member, that'd be fantastic. I'd welcome you there too. Uh, anything else we should want to talk about, Larry? Yeah, Marty, there are three questions that have come in. Uh, one is, when you're doing three-sided chip cuts, how do you control the depth? Is it the pressure on the knife? I think by implication, is it the position of the hand or pressure or both? The angle of the knife stays the same on all the cuts. So you would increase the pressure on the knife as the cut gets deeper, all right? And the, the pressure on the knife comes, is generated right above your index finger, all right? Some students occasionally will get a sore tip of their thumb. And whenever that happens, it's an indication that they're, they're pressing on the wrong place. Uh, they should be pressing with that right above your index finger. So if you get, so if I'm holding my knife like this, let's see how you can see it, like this, right here is where the pressure should come from. Not down on the tip of your thumb, that's just pressing needlessly onto the wood, but it comes right from here as you press the knife into the wood. So if you get a sore spot on your hand when you're first starting, it should be in here, not down here. All right, so yeah, to get make a deeper cut, you just have to press harder. Okay, the next question was, what is about lighting? Is what is the best position for lighting as you're carving? Yeah, good question. Lighting is really important um, to make nice, nice clean cuts and stay around your pattern lines. Um, I always recommend using daylight bulbs. All right, you when you look uh, for the light bulbs, they'll have a sort of a cool warm rating. 
And if you find a daylight rating, that's, a, that's the color you should get. If you're using regular incandescent bulbs, they're just too warm, they're too yellow. Uh, whereas those daylight are nice, bright, white color for your bulbs. And where do you position it? Well, if you're a right-hander, position it slightly off to, to your left so that you can um, get a good visibility of the lines you're carving. Um, that also, if it's slightly to your left and not directly overhead, that will create a shadow so that you know you can carve right on the edge of a neighboring chip if that's what your pattern your pattern is. Uh, so a little bit to your left, a little bit low, and that'll create a shadow of nice with nice bright white light. Yeah, the next question is uh, where do you, about plates to carve. Where do you get the plates to carve? I assume you're talking about the round plates. You can get any plate style and size on my website, mychipcarving.com. Look in the plates tab inside the store, and there you'll find a wide selection of all sizes and all different styles uh, with beaded rims or a scalloped edge, flat plates, scoop plates, uh, you name it, you'll find them there. And all the plates I sell are clear, designed for carving. So um, you get a good quality plates. Okay, the, the last question was, can you demonstrate cutting a circle? Sure. I'm gonna have to change my camera view. Okay, I'm gonna move things around here. So just like in Mary's webinar, get ready for the ride. How can I do this? All right. I guess I shouldn't, shouldn't have said sure so confidently. Hang on a second. So this is where you'll know I'm not in my office as I'm trying to get this set up here. Got it. Can you see that okay? Uh, I can see it okay. It's a little fuzzy in parts, but I think see I can see the circle parts. Okay. Is that okay right there if I carve yeah. this circle? Yes, yeah, go. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm using my modified knife, less metal on the spine. Normally I would carve these on my turntable. So much easier on a turntable than turning it by hand. So I get the depth and then I turn the material underneath the point of the knife. Okay. 
All right, once again. Get the depth. And then just maintain the depth and turn the board underneath the point of the knife. The hardest part can be meeting up the end of your cut with the starting point. So maybe uh, another question would be the opposite circle. If you wanted to leave the circle kind of as a button, what would, yeah. Okay, yeah, this, you can leave it on the surface rather than carve it away, just like that. All right, or you could do both. You could carve it away and remove the petals around the outside. All right, so we could do that all the way around. I think, around I, was, that. I, think I was remembering your box that had uh, on the Mary May video that you had uh, looked like three sided plus a lot of the circles around the outside. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, I've removed three corner chips around the outside of the circle rather than this one which is a floral pattern leading the center circle. Whoops. I guess I'll stop there. No band-aids, huh? I know I wondered if you'd noticed my ragged index finger. Oh, nobody wanted to ask. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was not from chip carving, okay? Put it in your notes. That's not chip carving. That was my deck building project. It looks like it bled. So time, time for some more questions, folks. You can either uh, unmute yourself and ask, or you can uh, put them in the chat and I'll read them. I can't see everybody's, I can only see a few people at a time, so I can't tell if you have your hands up or not. Uh, question was, where do you get a lazy Susan? They're in my store. The difference between the ones that I sell is that I have added that thick no slip mat to the surface of the lazy Susan. If you buy one on Amazon, they just come plain, plain plastic on the top and bottom. And it's just not good for holding your piece to chip carve uh, as you spin it around. So, um, yeah, a great no slip mat on the surface of mine. Uh, you can get them at mychipcarving.com. Go to the store, and they're on sale now for twenty dollars. Okay. Do you have anything to say about sign making? Uh, sort of sizable signs that were the, the lettering would be could it be chip carved you know large letters let's say a, maybe a 18 a two foot by three foot sign for example would that be something you would attempt with chip carving big knives or would you use more classical carving techniques you could carve a big sign with just standard chip carving technique and um 
Yeah, I carved a sign for our retreat center, uh, Red Barn Retreats, that measures, it's not huge, but the chips across the width are at least an inch, and that creates some pretty, pretty big cuts. Let me show you if I can find it here. Um, a, a recent chip carving that I did on um, a sculpture that I made. Hang on a second. Let me. Yeah, I can. I've got it right here. So as far as size, it is possible to make some very sizable structures from easy board. And boy, is it fun. I, I had a great time making this sculpture. Are you still selling little kits of samples of uh, easy board? Is that still available? Yeah, I do have, uh, I will send you some samples just to get a hold of me and send you a sample. And also know that I'll, I've got, and I'll cut any size or shape that you're looking for. That's not a problem. Okay. Hang on a second. I'm almost got this, this brought up here. About a year ago, we had a carving class and we had a blind carver. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, helpers to help him and it didn't work out because he couldn't actually figure out the grain. Um, and it was in spite of a lot of help that we had. He had been doing some carving before, but the HDU would have been a perfect material for him to do what he wanted to do. He's artistic kind of a definitely. guy. Yeah, definitely. All right, so there's my sculpture, and you get a you get an idea of the size. It measured four feet by six and a half feet tall, and you can see all those chips were hand carved. And then I added the coloring to it. Let me see if I can bring that in closer. Uh, let's see. Do you use bigger knives to, to get some of those bigger cuts? No, I used all my standard knives. Hmm. Now on some of the big chips, like these are some very sizable three corner chips all throughout and the big circles. I may have removed a smaller chip in the center first before making the final cuts. I'm looking at the uh, petals of the flower on the uh, right hand side about a third of the way up. I can't tell if those are gouge cuts or chip cuts. I assume they're, they're chip, but they look pretty big. Yeah, those are pretty sizable. Those are carved out and they are, you know, it's a real smooth curve on the end of each petal as well. Yeah, that was accepted. This sculpture was accepted into the Mankato City Art Walk. And I'm already working on my 2021 design and hopefully that will get accepted as well. Uh, another question came up about hand positioning is can you demonstrate the position of your wrist and the elbow while Cutting. Yes. Okay. I think as best I can. Let's see. Take the camera the other way like that. All right. So here you can see my hand, my wrist and elbow. Now this is, if I keep my wrist straight, that means I'm sort of carving across my body. So I'll tip my wrist out. That puts the 
the handle of the knife more in line with my forearm. If it's like this, it's going out this direction. But when you cock your wrist a little bit, it lines up the knife handle with your forearm more. So you can make nice straight cuts by just pulling back with your hand. All right, so that's the way uh, chip carving is done with good technique. All right, and then you sort of lock your wrist in that position and then move the board and move your hand. Your wrist will move, especially as you're making curve cuts. Your wrist does move and flex to make a nice smooth continuous cut. So it looks like on small pieces, your, your knuckles are on the board, but your wrist is floating and your elbow is floating. Is that typically the case? Yeah, you'll just, it'll move naturally as you're moving the board and the knife to follow the pattern line. So sometimes it's coordinated. The board will move, your wrist will move as you keep a flow with the knife. Okay. You just gain that the more chips you remove and the more practice you make, you get the flow to keep a nice continuous movement with your knife. Okay, thanks. So another question that came in was about painting. On the sculpture that you showed the picture of, what kind of paint was used on the sculpture? I used both a Rust-Oleum 2X Ultra Cover spray paint and I used uh, acrylic spray, uh, acrylic brush paint as well. So I used both of those. And let's see, what else did I use? That was, that was pretty much it. Uh, the, the spray paint by Rust-Oleum 2X has a great selection of colors. So I'd use that for various parts of the sculpture. And then I'd also use acrylics where I wanted a different color and different look. And is the piece primed ahead of time before you do anything? And what is, and is there a top coat on top of everything? All right, there is a finishing technique with Easy Board that is fantastic. And here's what you do. I'll just give you the quick rundown. You spray your base coat color on the piece that you're carving. All right, so it's first sprayed and then that dries. Then you take your pattern and you spray glue it onto vinyl masking. Now vinyl masking is a sign maker material and you spray glue your pattern onto the vinyl masking. You peel off the backing and you stick that onto your easy board and you roll it down with a hard rubber roller. Then you carve through the pattern and the masking. The masking is really thin. So you carve through the pattern, which is on the masking. And then when you're done, you just roll that down again so it's good and stuck on whatever's left. And then you can brush or spray the recesses. And then <laughs> after you peel off that masking, you've got crisp lines between the area that you carved and the background color. Uh, that is a fantastic way to color and carve easy board. Now on my sculpture, I did some of that, but not all of it. All right, so different parts were done different in the different manner. There are videos showing you how to do this at the Easy Carving website. So go there click on the videos tab and you'll see various finishing methods of this material. I'll show you how to use a gel stain. And with the spray paint and gel stain, you can make easy board look an awfully lot like wood if that's your desire. Okay, super. So any more questions before Marty falls asleep here? You can shout them out or you can uh, write them into chats. All 
Okay, I think we will probably pull the plug in a moment, but Marty, I wanna thank you out of the bottom of our heart that you gave us this material and spent the time. Uh, it's, it's a whole new world for me because I've never done any chip carving, but I'm looking forward to trying it. I've accumulated some old knives, but I think I will probably put those aside and accumulate something new. Um, and I don't know what uh, anybody else would do, but there is one more question. It says, how durable is the easy board? Yeah, durable uh, is its middle name because sign makers use it for their outdoor signs so that they hold up over long time periods. Okay, they're completely weather resistant and they're, they're not gonna warp or chip or crack or rot. So that's why sign makers choose this product to make their signs with. So when you carve it, put it outside if you like, keep it inside, it's gonna last a long, long time. What happens if you stick it under water for a long period of time? Will it dissolve or just not do anything? No, it won't do anything. Nothing, okay. Okay. Okay, with that, I'm gonna say that's the end of the questions. And so I will uh, pull the plug pretty in a moment and say thank you again, Marty. And I will send you a, uh, probably a, some feedback on the uh, experience in an email in a couple of days. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the website and around. So thank you very much. My pleasure, thanks, Larry. Thank you, thank you everybody for, for thank coming. You. Thanks, Marty. Yeah. Thanks to everyone. Okay. Here we go.